Hey everyone, welcome to my kitchen here in Los Angeles. My name is Jocelyn Ramirez, and I am the chef and founder of a plant-based food business here called Todo Verde that focuses on Mexican plant-based food. And I'll give you a little brief intro about who I am and why I'm doing it before we dive into uh, the ingredients that we're gonna be talking about today. First of all, I wanna give a special shout out and thank you to Lexus for making this class possible. So I started Todo Verde back in 2015 because I wanted to be able to create more healthy plant-based food that felt culturally relevant. So when I went plant-based many years ago, I think it's been maybe seven or eight years, maybe more at this point, uh, I decided to make that leap to vegetarian and plant-based. And it was really hard for me to find the ingredients, the uh, prepared food, all the things that made me feel like I was still uh, getting all of the uh, the flavors and the nostalgia that I crave, that I really wanted to enjoy in a meal. And so I began to really go through several different ingredients, going to different types of grocery stores and figuring out how to put things together that could recreate those flavors. So that is how I began Todo Verde and have now evolved to uh, you know, do tons of catering across the city. I also published a cookbook called La Vida Verde that came out last April and it has 60 plant-based recipes. You can definitely check that out on our website at soloverde.org. But I want to get into all these ingredients and essentially what I did is I took everything out of my, my cupboards. I mean, not everything, but definitely a lot of things are out here and I'm going to try to cover as, in as much detail but hopefully not to overwhelm you. I'll try to go slow and steady and we'll answer your questions along the way. So I definitely encourage all of you to take notes, to enter your questions into the chat. And I'm happy to answer those questions after we go through each category. And I do have sort of uh, uh, categories or buckets as I'm thinking about them. We'll talk about meat alternatives. We'll talk about nuts and seeds of course, grains and flowers, as well as legumes. And then we'll get into some flavor enhancers or as many of us know it, umami flavors, what can really make those, those bold flavors come out of your dishes. We'll talk a little bit about sweeteners and then some other random things that you maybe have heard of, but you're like, I'm not really quite sure how to use that or what that is like probiotics or agar agar. We'll talk about those things. Greens, which are essential to any diet, whether you're plant-based or whatever you're trying at the moment, definitely including more greens and a few supplements that adds folks who are plant-based should integrate a little bit more into their everyday lifestyle. So again, I'll go in category by category. I'll try to cover as much info as I can, and you can definitely enter your questions into the chat box. I'll give a moment to check on any questions after I cover any particular category and then we'll move on to the next category. So again, just take those notes down. And if even after this class, you have any questions, you can always reach out to me, which I'll share more about after this is uh, this class is complete. So let's get into the first category, which is our meat alternatives, which I think is the biggest one. Um, I think meats and cheeses tend to be the thing that many people find is is hard for them to let go. And this is a perfect time to talk about this because we just finished January, the first month of the year. I think a lot of people start January uh, perhaps trying to be vegetarian, plant-based, vegan. And uh, now that we're in February, are people going back to their uh, previous lifestyle and the way that they ate? Or are they looking for ways to continue to integrate uh, meat alternatives or whatever it may be into their everyday life. And even in that one month that I know many people uh, were exploring plant-based, I know that you're kind of cooking the same thing over and over again, which is definitely what I encourage at first for people to try to cook the meals that you already know how to cook, whether you made them with meat or dairy or whatever it was, try to see if you can find an easy alternative to recreate that same exact meal using a few different ingredients. So you just swap a few things out, but still use the same techniques mostly and the same bold flavor that you would use for your favorite dishes. And then hopefully you're able to easily kind of um, gradually, I would say, 
uh, ease your way into more of these easy at home plant based dishes. So let's get into that first uh, option. And I see somebody in here already talking about jackfruit. Yes, absolutely. If you have my book, um, and if you've ever eaten my food, Todo Verde, I definitely use quite a bit of jackfruit. And the question I get is why? Why jackfruit? And it's mostly two reasons. Uh, the first reason being that jackfruit has a really, really nice texture that feels very much like meat. It shreds just like a meat. Um, it almost feels like a like a pulled chicken, pulled pork kind of dish. And you can um, really flavor it anyway. So which is a second reason. It takes on any flavor that you give it. Now, what's really important whenever you're picking up jackfruit is to make sure that you're getting young green jackfruit. So you don't wanna get the sweet ripened jackfruit. You don't wanna pick up a, a fresh jackfruit typically found at health food stores or Asian markets because by the time they're cut in wherever they're at, usually in an Asian country and imported here to the US, they've already developed some sugar, they've already ripened slightly. And so they won't serve the same purpose. They won't uh, uh, have the same texture or flavor profile that you would need for a savory dish. So you definitely want to stick to a young green jackfruit. Now this isn't a brine. And what I like to do is just give it a good rinse, squeeze it, and then um, uh, break it down with a knife a little bit to just uh, separate. There's some seeds and some cores and all of it's edible. Do not throw any of it away. Uh, and then season it really nicely cook it in a little bit of oil, you are going to be set, you can add sauces to it once it's seared and kind of browned and slightly crispy. It's a really great alternative. And I think for folks in my community, I grew up in Southeast Los Angeles, which is known as a food desert. And a lot of people there tend to really rely on meat. Um, you know, and so this seems like an easy transfer for people to be able to make it's a really e easy ingredient to work with as well. And it's pretty low on the processing spectrum in that it's a fruit, it was cut up before it ripened, and they put it in a brine to just stop it from ripe ripening. And there it is. Um, so this is why I really love jackfruit. It doesn't have a lot of protein. It's not a one for one to replace your chicken or whatever meat product you have out there. So you still want to include your greens, your legumes, your whole grains, um, and nuts, seeds, all the things that are definitely going to uh, still give you that nice balance of protein, which is the number one question that I get as a plant-based person. How do you get your protein? It's like, oh, <laughs> the, you know, with all the other things that have so much protein in, in them. So young green jacket is the first one. And then of course, I am a huge lover of mushrooms. I always have mushrooms on hand. Uh, my favorites are definitely oyster mushrooms and shiitakes. These I find are my go-tos because I really love oyster mushrooms and the fact that you can really shred them. You can use your hands to just shred the mushroom and cook them in some oil at a high temperature, season them in any which way, and they uh, really take on that flavor. And you can also get a little bit of crispiness out of them, which is really nice. And then shiitakes, um, I really love to use in a lot of soups, uh, I also use shiitakes to make a bacon out of them because they have this really nice kind of um, uh, texture that feels a little bit fatty once they're cooked and they're a little bit spongy, I would say. And so I really like to thin slice these, flavor them up, make them taste like bacon. You can use them for a whole lot of different dishes. So those mushrooms, you definitely want to integrate as much as you can. I also like to... Um, Aside from just like uh, um, uh, shredding them or slicing them, sometimes what I do is I use a food processor, chop, rough chop, mince them up in a food processor, and add chorizo seasoning to them. Add you know, add the chile paste, add the little bit of cinnamon, the clove, the all the things that are going to give that chorizo flavor. And it's gonna be so wonderful with mushrooms because they have uh, what I feel has like the most um, close to meat uh, flavor that comes out of them. Uh, and so that is really, really a great ingredient to work with. You just have to know how to flavor it, right? Next up we have tempeh. So if you have never worked with tempeh before, this one's actually open. And you're literally like going through my fridge right now, everybody. 
So my cupboards and my fridge. So some things are open, some things are not. But tempeh is this fermented, uh, typically made out of soy, this fermented soy kind of brick, as you can see. And it's different than tofu. I mean, we've all seen tofu, uh, right? We've probably all had tofu if we don't have a soy allergy. And I think that tempeh is another one that's really easy for people to integrate that has more of a chewy texture than tofu does. And it's so easy to just crumble into a pan. I'm just gonna crumble on my counter, but you can easily, you know, just crumble this up in your pan and it takes on any flavor that you give it. Add tons of spices to it, pan fry it in a little bit of oil. Sometimes I like to dice this up and pan fry it in some oil. Don't season it with anything. Like I just pan fry it until it's really brown and crispy and like almost to the point where it's about to burn, but it doesn't. And then I pull it out, I season it with salt heavily, and it tastes so much like chicharron. If you've ever had chicharron, and I've given that to people for catering over and over and over again, and they're like, whoa, I am shocked by how much that tastes like chicharron. And you can also get that same similar effect by putting oyster mushrooms, which is another trick that I do. Oyster mushrooms, oil, salt, pepper, they're shredded, they're on a baking sheet, Put them at your, in your oven at 350 for like 20 minutes, maybe close to 30 if you need to, depending on your if your oven temperature is a little off. And you're going to get this really nice, uh, crunchy, salty, chicharron style flavor that you can add as a, as a garnish, as a topping to something that'll give it a nice bit of crunch. It could be a soup and you just add those on top a little pile. It's perfect. So tempeh is another thing that you can do that with. And I think that this is uh, an un unsung hero. You usually see it in you know, the little brick at the grocery store next to the tofu and everyone's like, oh, what is that? I've never used it before. Tempeh is great. It's, it's so easy to work with. So definitely another one you should definitely keep on your radar. I don't have tofu, believe it or not, on hand. I thought I did, but we've all seen tofu and there's a variety of different types of tofu. If you've ever been to an Asian grocery store, I was just telling the folks before this class started that I'd like to go to my local Chinese grocery store about once a month to just pick up spices or uh, just things that I use on the regular to season my food. Um, if you go to the tofu section, it's, you know, our regular grocery stores probably have like this much section of tofu. And then you go to a Chinese or Asian grocery store and it's like this much section of tofu. It's like tofu skin, uh, silken tofu, firm tofu, like so many types of tofu. And I really like to use silken to um, blend, to kind of give a creamy texture to a sauce or to a smoothie. Um, and then for more of the firm textures, I like to do a really nice crumble with, I'll actually give a sneak peek into my, um, uh, my flavor enhancers, but this black salt tastes so sulfury that it gives this kind of egg-like flavor to your tofu. You can do a tofu scramble. Uh, I, I like to use tofu a ton of different ways, but sometimes I'll blend it in a sauce. Sometimes I will just crumble it up. Sometimes I will pan fry it, but it's very rare that you will see me have like cubes of tofu in something because I like to kind of really penetrate the flavor into something. And I just find that even when I marinate tofu, it's still not all the way marinated to the center. So I just prefer a crumble. That's just my personal preference. I highly recommend it. Even if you are have, have found that you're maybe not the biggest tofu fan, um, try crumbling it, seasoning it heavily um, with a little cumin, a, li a little bit of um, mushroom powder, some turmeric, some chili flakes, some salt, pepper, and you're already gonna have a super delicious dish. Last couple things here, heart of palm. Now this is a staple in our Todo Verde. I'm like, which way? You can see the heart of palm there. And you can probably see a picture of the, the cylinder shape of the heart of palm down here. And so this is a staple in our ceviche. And it is exactly what it sounds like. It's literally the heart or the inside of a palm that you typically find in South America. And uh, they come in these cylinder shapes. I like to just slice mine into coins. Some people like to mince theirs, dice it, and you can add it to a ceviche with tons of fresh produce from cucumber, tomatoes, lots of citrus, um, 
cilantro, chile, like jalapeno or serrano. And you can get this really, and don't forget the avocado. If you're not allergic to avocado, I mean, I love avocado <laughs> that much. Um, it's definitely a staple for any ceviche that you're making. Well, Mexican style ceviche, I should say, maybe not Peruvian style. Um, but this for me has this almost um, like crab-like texture and flavor. Um, this was probably, seafood was one of the hardest things for me to uh, to walk away from when I decided to go plant-based. And so heart of palm and believe it or not, even mushrooms. I, I make a Mexican style cocktail, like a seafood cocktail, um, mincing up oyster mushrooms and marinating them in the citrus, like the lemon or lime juice with a little bit of tomato juice and then add all the other uh, veggies to it. So, so delicious. I'm also going to talk about some of these um, processed meats. Seitan is included in this. So if you haven't really played around with seitan or made it at home, uh, I think it's something that's be becoming more and more familiar with people who are eating more plant-based. Um, but essentially it's made out of gluten. It's a, it's a vital wheat gluten and it looks just like a flour. And instead of, um, sometimes you can bake it, a lot of people boil it and food grade plastic to get uh, a flavored loaf that you can slice like a meat. And so this was seitan that is sliced and hickory smoked. And I use it in sandwiches like I would a ham. And it is so good. It is so, so good. You, uh, you know, once you try this, it will be, it will definitely be a game changer. There are others out there. Like for example, I was talking about the ceviche. Here's another one, right, that you can use for a ceviche. It's a, um, a plant-based tuna that uses mostly soy, but there are other things like pea protein and so on and so forth. Um, and this freakishly tastes a lot like tuna. The flavor is there. If you don't have this, you can absolutely use something like a, like for example, like a so, um, te TVP, textured soy protein or here at the Mexican, Mexican grocery store, it's just soya, soya texturada. And you can see here these little dry pieces of soy that when rehydrated end up um, having this very meat-like texture. I use these to make carne asada, but you can also flavor these to be more of like your, your sort of like your tuna here. We can add citrus. In this case, if I were making a, a tuna from this, um, I would also add kelp. Um, I would add some seaweed, like whatever seaweed I have on hand in the marinating process to help kind of absorb some of that sea flavor that obviously tuna or most seafood have. So there's lots out there in the market that you can check out that are already trying to recreate our things that we miss, right? Like the tunas and things like that. So you can pick them up or you can explore with some of these more raw ingredients uh, like the jackfruit, the heart of palm, the textured soy. And this is these are like the things that we use with todo verde, but at home I do play around. Like this I wouldn't use for work, but at home every once in a while, it's like, okay, that's fun. It, it kind of switches it up slightly. And the last couple things that I'll just mention for this section, although they're technically not like a, well, these are kind of meat alternatives. Let me bring them to the forefront here. So I have here, this is a thick soy sheet. This is essentially a sheet that forms on the top of uh, when someone may be making like soy milk or something like that. And this sheet can also be flavored. Uh, it could You can add liquid smoke to it and other seasoning to make it taste similar to a ham. You can make it taste like a bacon. You can pop it in the oven, have it sizzle a little bit and get nice and seared. So you can really transform something like this because essentially, you know, the things that we love are, are flavored with uh, the techniques that we use, like smoking, like uh, like using ingredients like chiles and so on and so forth and spices. So one thing I always like to remind folks of is you like that meat thing because it's flavored with plants. 
you like that, you know, that smoked whatever, because it's flavored with the plant that is smoking and giving it that flavor. You love the, you know, the chile flavored blah, 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 because it's flavored with plants with all those chiles and the spices. Use those same plants to flavor it other things and see how far you can develop those flavors. And shockingly, a lot of times it's really good. And I've fooled people uh, when we've done catering who actually think that they are eating meat, which is like, okay, <laughs> you're a meat eater. I was able to make you believe, even though I wasn't trying to, I say I'm plant-based all the time, but they thought they were eating meat. And, uh, and that for me is a game changer that it could actually, you know, transform the way people think about food. Another one that's kind of similar to the textured soy, um, because this is also soy based, which is a bean curd. Um, and again, it's similar to, you know, this sheet, but then has been put into a roll, which would easily rehydrate and take on any flavor that you give it. So this you see a lot in Asian cooking, and you can definitely transform this to be anything that you um, want it to be flavor wise. They're essentially blank canvases. Another one that I like to have on hand is rice paper um, wrapping. You usually see these for your spring rolls or for, um, yeah, typically spring rolls, right? You can also flavor these and and cook them in the oven. I've done, I've done a variety of different things with these and they end up being like nice and crispy. You can double them up so they're not as crispy and uh, a little bit more softer on the texture and will also take on an amazing flavor. I've seen another business make bacon out of this for sandwiches and I was blown away by it. So of course I can't not talk about cheeses. Uh, I'm pretty sure somebody in here is like, where's my cheese, where's my cheese? And I know that that wasn't a category, but I'm gonna just pop in here with the cheeses. I mean, plant-based cheeses out on the market today are a game changer. Um, I think that when I first went plant-based about eight or so years ago, these products were not on the shelves back then. And, and thankfully, I wasn't as big of a cheese fan back then as I know many people are. So I was able to get by okay. Um, but nowadays, you know, you can find everything that's like thin sliced cheese to shredded cheese, so on and so forth. You can find it. And it's just a matter of you going out there. And every time you hit the grocery store, you might find, you pick one up and you try it and you're like, wow, this is amazing. Sometimes it's not always the case. And that's the way you learn which products you like and you don't like. So it's a matter of trial and error, giving things to your neighbors or like seeing, okay, this cheese is not that great in this dish, but can I use it in this other dish? Um, I find that the plant-based cheeses that I wasn't particularly fond of, if I use it on something that's like pretty spicy, the chile with the cheese tends to kind of like mellow out whatever I don't like. That's just a trick I have for not throwing things away because I don't love food waste. I hope no one does. Um, so if that is a case where you're like, oh, I, I didn't really like that particular brand, can you put it in something um, you know, that's going to uh, have another element that's going to kind of overpower the flavor of that cheese um, to, to make it more pleasant for you? So that's just a tip if you don't like it, but I'm telling you that there are really great brands out there that you will be blown away by. And again, I have shared these cheeses with friends and family and they're like, whoa, this is actually really, really delicious. Now for me, I also like to, I enjoy making my own cheese and I'll talk about some of the ingredients that I use to make those cheeses. But that, but I know not everybody's like out the gate, like let me make some cheese. They, you might wanna buy it and then explore later on down the line how you might make it. So that is the first category of meat alternatives with a little side note about cheeses. So let me check the comments and the notes here or the questions. And of course, feel free to keep adding anything else that comes up along the way. Yes, uh, Kelly, I will be talking about dried mushrooms. One of my favorite things in the kitchen, seriously, dried mushrooms. We'll get into that in just a moment. Let's see here. What kind of plant-based options do you use to replace carne asada? Okay, so I mentioned the carne asada soy protein and the carnitas, definitely jackfruit. All right, trying to find cheese alternatives. Yes, yeah, so it is a little tough with nut allergies, but however, you can definitely make um, some of these cheeses without nuts in them. Um, and one alternative could be pepitas, which I'll talk about in a second as well. 
let's see here. Ooh, folks are already giving their recommendations in here with things that they like to use. Okay. And then for mushrooms, I see a question here about washing mushrooms. I would not wash mushrooms. I typically don't unless I get a case of mushrooms that are really dirty, like they have a lot of dirt on them. I'll give them a really, really quick wash. But one thing about mushrooms that I think is kind of like, um, gives them a bad reputation for a lot of folks is that um, two things, people wash them and mushrooms are like uh, strawberries. Uh, they absorb, right? They absorb and they hold on to that liquid. And then when you go to pan fry them or to put them in the oven, you don't get that crisp that you want because they're so drenched in the liquid that they absorbed. So instead get a damp towel or a good sturdy paper towel and give them a good wipe down, especially if they look kind of dirty, you wanna give them a good wipe down, but you don't wanna wash them unless absolutely necessary. Um, there's been times where I'm like, oh, I can't wipe these down enough. I just need to give them a really quick rinse. Um, and the other thing with mushrooms, high temperature. So turn on your fan, open your windows, high temperature, good amount of oil. Don't be shy about the oil with mushrooms, especially if you're pan searing and don't crowd your pan. So don't throw all the mushrooms into the pan and expect them to get nice and seared. What's gonna happen is that they're gonna soft down and they're gonna stew more than they're gonna sear. So cook them in batches and you're gonna get much better results. Let's see, I, and perfect, I see here about the damp cloth perfect about the mushrooms. Um, and then for mushrooms uh, that are reasonably priced, I mean, sometimes when you go to the farmer's market, they will have a section that mushroom farmers might have a section of mushrooms that are, um, they're not selling at full price because maybe they're a bit um, like they're florets of oyster mushrooms, but they're kind of broken up a little bit. And I don't mind that because I know I'm either going to mince them up, I'm going to hand shred them, so I don't need them to look like beautiful florets. So that's a trick that I have to try to save a little bit on like really good quality fresh mushrooms. Um, otherwise, Asian grocery stores are great for mushrooms as well too. You can typically find several different varieties. They typically come in packages like this. These did come from an Asian market and you can see they're wrapped in plastic, um, but that's another good place to find good mushrooms at an affordable price. Uh, yeah, I'm loving all the mushroom questions here. People are like, wow, okay, I love mushrooms now. And if you don't love mushrooms, it's okay. I have friends who don't love mushrooms. I am obsessed with them, but you can still get by with a ton of other things like the jackfruit or like the soy products or the processed meats. Um, all right, so I am going to circle back. If there's like anything that I didn't answer, uh, cause I wanna move on, you can definitely circle back to this again at the end but I am going to move on to uh, the next section. And I see here our burgers fall apart with a good binder for veggie patties. If you're making your own homemade veggie patties, you could use a black bean paste, like a rough um, uh, black bean paste, and that will help definitely as a binder. If you're okay with using something like a breadcrumb, you could do something like that, just very light on it, like a pinko breadcrumb will help become a binder as well too. Um, but yeah, things that are, think about things that are dry or things that are kind of, uh, like the beans are going to kind of help mold it a little bit and that helps. And again, be gentle with it. I know when people cook things, they want to flip it, flip it over, flip it over again, leave it, <laughs> let it cook for a good amount of time, check it to see if it's searing and then flip it over and leave it. So don't go back and forth too much with whatever it is that you're searing. So Thinking about time here, let's go into the next things. I know that those were the biggest ones and I'll, trust me, I'll come back to questions towards the end. So I'm gonna kind of breeze a little bit through these nuts and seeds, but the main things that I wanna talk to you about are the ones that I use the most. And those are, it's like all of them. <laughs> You're like, Jocelyn, all of them? You're bringing all of them forward. Okay, so the thing that I use the most is cashews. So I like to buy whole um, cashew pieces. So just raw cashew pieces, sorry, not whole. Raw cashew pieces, because this is gonna become uh, a cheese, a crema, a cheesecake. It's gonna get blended, it's gonna get soaked. No one's gonna know if this was a whole beautiful fancy cashew or a piece. 
just make sure they're raw versus toasted because I want to mask the flavor of cashews. And really what these serve as is a texture, a really smooth, creamy texture. Um, I'm not a huge fan of eating raw cash or eating cashews, period, whether they're toasted or not. I'm not even a big fan of cashew milk, <laughs> believe it or not. But cashews behind the scenes, using their texture all up in the recipe, I'm down with that. So I really love cashews. They're a big source of a lot of the, the recipes that we have with Dolo Verde. So uh, cashews for cheeses, cashews for caramas. And then for a cheese like a um, queso fresco, I also use almonds. Um, and so I use, sometimes I'll use the almond slivers because they are already peeled, as you can see there. Sometimes I'll use whole almonds and after soaking them, I will uh, peel them individually, which is kind of a pain, but totally still okay. Uh, and so with any of these nuts, like the cashews or the almonds, you would soak them. And if you don't have a high power blender at home, uh, then you can definitely soak them overnight. Give them at least a couple hours to soak. Um, and if the water is hot or really warm, um, that will also help the rehydration process to happen. And what that does is it just helps you to be able to blend them until smooth and creamy and not having uh, little bits of cashews or almonds in whatever mixture you're creating, whether it's a sauce or um, you can also use these to make your own milks if you wanted to. Because believe it or not, the milks that you find at the grocery store, the prepackaged ones, it's like a tiny little bit of almonds and then a bunch of other stuff, usually water. Um, and so you can make your own plant-based milks, just get a nut milk bag so that you can strain the mixture properly and you don't have any bits in your, um, in your milk. You can do this with oats. You can do it with a ton of different things. So those are really, really my favorites. And then I have a couple others here. Walnuts. You find them everywhere, right? Walnuts all the time. And they typically don't get a lot of love. Now, if you use a food processor and you blitz these until they become sort of like a ground meat texture, add some rehydrated sun-dried tomatoes, add some, you know, you could add chipotle and adobo, you could add um, lots of different flavors to it to give it this sort of like ground meat. Like this could be your burger as well too, if you get enough moisture in there. Um, and it has very much like a ground meat texture to it. And once it cooks, it gets a little soft. Um, just make sure that you blitz it enough so that it's not a fine powder that you're looking for, but you don't want big chunks that feel crunchy afterwards. You want to get just in between so that it looks like a ground meat and that when you bite into it, you don't bite into pieces of walnuts, so to speak, that it, it feels a little bit more soft um, uh, when you chew into it. I also love using pepitas, um, different than if you buy pumpkin seeds, pumpkin seeds sometimes have the hole on them and uh, pepitas have already been holed. So when you buy them at the store, they might be raw pepitas that are just uh, a pretty vibrant green. And I always have dried toasted ones on hand. Um, so I'll just grab some of these, I'll dry toast them in just a dry skillet until, or you can do it in the oven until they kind of puff up, they become slightly brown. They have this beautiful flavor that emerges. Um, and you can use that to make everything from a, uh, people are now using this for like a like an egg scramble um, instead of using tofu. So instead of having a soy base, if you have a soy allergy, you could use something like that to um, pretty much like grind it down uh, with some water to get that sort of crumbly texture of a scramble. So that's something you can also do uh, a hummus with this if you are not a huge fan of garbanzo beans. And of course, like pipianas and a bunch of other sauces that are typical of Mexico call for pepitas. So one of my favorites. Uh, the other thing here is sunflower seeds. It's more than just your baseball game treat. So sunflower seeds. Um, if you are a fan of cloudy broths, so if you love caldos, if you love ramen, if you love soups that have this nice depth of flavor, blend a little bit, like it doesn't have to be a lot, maybe um, a quarter cup, a half a cup, depending on how much soup you're making of these um, toasted, ses uh, it's not sesame seeds, these are toasted sunflower seeds with your vegetable broth. 
And until it's nice and smooth, you can also strain it through a nut milk bag to catch any little bits. And you're gonna have this like beautiful, rich, cloudy broth that is perfect for a ramen. Um, and it's just enough to flavor the broth, not enough for where you take a sip of the broth and you're like, oh my gosh, that tastes like sunflower seeds. It's it's like definitely a note in the background. And that's what you're looking for. Just a, a flavor enhancer, but not necessarily an overpowering uh, flavor profile. So that is your sunflower seeds. And then other things that I have here um, are hemp seeds. If you're new to plant-based, hemp seeds are a whole protein. You can add these to smoothies, top your oatmeal, add it to your plant-based yogurt. Um, I love having plant-based yogurt on hand. You can buy it store-bought nowadays. I like to buy plain everything and flavor it myself. And I always add hemp seeds, which is why you can see that it's nearly empty and I have to get a new batch. And of course, chia seeds, I can't live without. If you've ever had our aguas frescas with todo verde, they all have chia seeds in them, whether it's black rice horchata, our strawberry rose amorcito. We have chia seeds in all of them because chia seeds, believe it or not, were a big staple in agua fresca that our ancestors typically added to them. Um, and over time, we do that less and less to the point where you just don't really see it in agua fresca. So I really wanted to bring that back to the forefront of what I've learned um, in Mexican cuisine and specifically in agua fresca. Now flaxseed, um, you can get whole flaxseed, linaza, um, and eat it this way, or you can get ground. Now this is great. I'm gonna talk about egg replacers in a second, but this is a uh, egg replacer that I use for baking just because it's very low on the processing scheme of things. You can add, for example, if you wanted to get three eggs, three tablespoons of this with seven and a half tablespoons of water and just let it mix and sit for a couple minutes before adding it to your batter of your, your cake batter, whatever it is. And you're gonna get a nice binder for eggs, for pancakes, whatever it may be, it's gonna help hold it together. For pancakes, I actually like to use bananas as a binder for mine. Um, but I like to add flaxseed to my yogurt and things like that to add a little bit of a crunch to it. Um, but word on the street is if it's not broken down, if you swallow it whole, you're not really able to get the nutrients out of it, which is like inside of the flaxseed. So ground is a great alternative, just if you wanna get the nutrient benefits out of it. And last things for the grains here are, I mean, they're so obviously, I was gonna talk about, you know, brown rice. I'm a big fan of anything that you have in your kitchen that is white right now, white bread, white rice, white sugar, white whatever, try to see if you can find a brown version of it. Uh, brown sugar, it could be raw turbinado, which is what I prefer to use, brown rice, wheat bread, wheat pasta, like all the things. I really try to um, stay away from all the, the white ingredients. Um, so, you know, hence like brown rice, black rice. This is the black rice that I use for my, um, this is actually berry rice, which is slightly different, but it's in the family. Um, but I make arroz con leche, I make horchata, I can cook this and make it into a rice salad. Um, it could be a side just on its own, um, but it definitely tastes better when you, if you cook it and you add other things to it, uh, like a sauce or something like that, definitely enhances the flavor. But definitely black rice is great. It's more nutrient dense. You want to have it in your cupboard. If you've never had black rice or chata, it's a game changer make sure you try that. It's a recipe I have in my book. And uh, quinoa. Uh, quinoa, I think people think, oh, quinoa salad. I don't really want a quinoa salad. I'm kind of, uh, it's good, but not that great. I mean, have it in place of oatmeal a few mornings and see how you feel. It's definitely higher in protein, more nutrient dense. Um, you can add cacao to it and make like a chocolatey um, porridge for yourself in the morning. I really love using quinoa. It's a staple in my kitchen all the time. So let me check in to see what questions we have that came in before we hop into the next bucket. And I know this is taking a while here, but I get really chatty with these ingredients because I just love talking about all things plant-based. So let's see here. We are, so yes, I see somebody here with uh, ingredients that they use for plant-based cheeses, absolutely. 
And the cheeses that I have in my book are, I mean, most of the recipes that I have on my book are very simplified because I wanted to make it as easy as possible. But you can keep adding to it and make it even more delicious. Um, and so, yeah, avocado ice cream. Yes, it's a, that is also another recipe in my book. I have avocado ice cream. I have avocado um, uh, cacao pudding. So many different things. Macadamia nuts. Yes, that's not a staple that I have in my cupboard all the time. I actually do have some, but I didn't bring them down. But you can also use macadamia nuts as a, a as a potential cheese option. You can uh, um, blitz it in a food processor to get a sort of crumbly cheese. And I'll talk about some flavor enhancers that you can use for that. Um, or you could also um, uh, soak them in liquid and also make a milk or cheese base or whatever it may be. Um, and that those bases that you use, like if you really love macadamia, if you really love cashews, you really love almonds, and you make a, a you know, like a paste out of them, a very smooth paste, you can add it to a tomato sauce. You can add it, you know, you can, if it's nice and thick and you season it with salt or a few other ingredients, maybe a bit of, um, uh, lemon juice for a really simple recipe. You can use it as a ricotta for your lasagna or whatever it may be. Um, for me, I used it for queso fresco and for um, uh, like a quesadilla cheese. So you can definitely play around with it here. All right, so let's get into our next category. I didn't talk too much about uh, with that last one with legumes. I mean, I think that we're all pretty familiar with beans and, and lentils. One thing I will say is if you are, I eat a lot of beans, <laughs> obviously, right? Um, I'm plant-based, I'm Mexican, like I, I just love beans. I love black beans. I love uh, pintos, so many de peruanos. Um, if you feel like, oh, I don't want to just have like a, you know, frijoles de la olla, just beans as is or beans as a side, you can make them into a salad. You can season them really nicely with some olive oil, some citrus and lots of veggies. Um, you can also make them frijoladas, which is oftentimes what I do with any beans. Um, like maybe I ate beans one way today and tomorrow I'm like, oh, I don't want to eat beans that way. Blend them with the juice that they cooked in or vegetable broth if they're canned beans and until they're smooth and add other ingredients to them. And you can make a really smooth, uh, creamy sauce that you can uh, use to coat tortillas, uh, just lightly pan fried tortillas to make a really delicious enfrijoladas dish. Um, so you're getting your beans, you're getting your tortillas, you're getting everything that you maybe were like, oh, I don't wanna eat that today, but it just tastes so different because it's a different approach um, to the ingredients. So, so even if you feel like you made a pot of beans and you're not gonna eat all those beans, find different ways to make them fun and um, and and kind of exciting each time you eat them. So now for the big one, we're gonna get into flavors. So I'm gonna go through a series of things. I'll go through a little bit more briefly. I wanna make sure I'm like trying to keep us on track of time here. So somebody asked earlier, dried mushrooms. I got you. So I love dried mushrooms a lot. Um, and I have a few varieties of them. So I love, you know, just regular old dried mushrooms. This is a medley of, uh, it's porcinis, chanterelles, oyster, um, different types of mushrooms. I have woodier mushrooms on hand. I also have mushroom powder, which I actually put into a little shaker um, here with the, my other spices. So I can easily just sprinkle some of this on something I may be sauteing just to enhance the flavor slightly. Um, and this really amplifies that flavor. It gives it a little something extra. And honestly, with a lot of these flavor enhancers, you just want to add enough to be like, oh, what is that? They're, this tastes like really good. What is that flavor I'm feeling in the background? Not like, oh, wow, this tastes like mushroom powder. You don't want that, right? So it's just enough to, to bring out those bold flavors, not enough to overpower. So there's a fine line you're walking when you're using these flavor enhancers. But definitely, broths, um, uh, when I'm doing beans, like cooking frijoles de la olla, I use an Instapot and I just uh, add dried mushrooms, avocado leaves, bay leaves. I sprinkle this on a bunch of stuff. I use these snow mushrooms, um, which you can pick up at your local Asian grocery store. 
to make menudo. So these rehydrated look a lot like the stomach lining that is typically used in menudo dishes. So I love snow mushrooms. Um, and I also have, here it is, mushroom paste. So I have a little bit of mushroom everything. So I, I, I like to use this mushroom paste also for sauteing or for soups um, or anything where I just feel like it just needs a little bit of a flavor enhancer. And it, it's essentially just smoked mushrooms that have been blended to a paste. And I just add a little teaspoon or something into whatever it is that I'm cooking. I also like to use um, uh, a bouillon base. Uh, if I am using, um, if I'm making a soup and I'm using water, uh, and I don't add vegetable broth, I can use this bouillon paste to just amplify the flavor. And in fact, I've actually used this to um, add a little bit to oyster mushrooms that I'm sauteing towards the end. One thing I didn't mention with, with your sauteing mushrooms or your crisping them, pan searing them, add the salt at the end. So I tend to not salt until it's closer to the end time of cooking, just because that salt kind of brings out that liquid that the mushrooms naturally have. So I like to focus on like, let's just try to crisp these up slightly. And then at the end, I'll hit it with a good amount of salt. Sometimes I'll hit it with like a little bit of um, chicken based chicken, not real chicken, based bouillon or something like that, just to enhance flavor, but not at the beginning, because then I'm gonna get a sort, sort of like soupy, soppy um, mushroom mixture. So love to use those. And then uh, another big one is, nutritional yeast. So this flaky powder, uh, I use it for a lot of cheeses and it has this sort of like funky, uh, cheesy smell to it. When I make nacho cheese, this is a main ingredient. When I make my quesadilla cheese, this is uh, not a main ingredient, but it's definitely there as a, as a back note. And in fact, I just made cheesecake the other day and I was like, I haven't ever added this to my cheesecake, but I wonder, and I did it and it was bomb. Um, so it was really good. So, you know, cause I was like, this is what I use for savory dishes. I wouldn't use it for sweet, but it translated, translated really well. And, and again, it doesn't have to be a lot of it, just enough to be like, oh, okay. There's something in there that tastes kind of cheesy. Duh, it's a cheesecake and it worked beautifully. Let's see here, apple cider vinegar. I mean, we all have vinegar at home. This I use in like my chorizos and sauteing and stuff like that. It just gives a nice bit of acid, like a sharp, like a brightness of acid that's different than a lemon juice because lemon could also kind of take over. So if you need a little bit of acid, you can use a white vinegar or an apple cider vinegar. And this is true for all cooking really, but um, but really the apple cider vinegar is my favorite and I love to pickle things with it. Um, and I, I like to use um, half and half apple cider to white vinegar when I'm pickling, just cause the apple cider does have a little bit of a, a more of a flavor to it than white vinegar. Um, but I, I just absolutely love it. Liquid aminos, easy replacement here for your uh, soy sauce and liquid aminos is going to be one of those things that's also an umami flavor. Uh, it has like a, a savory, salty, um, you know, punch to it. And I add it to dishes, Mexican dishes. Um, and I add just enough to give a flavor uh, a enhancement, not enough where it starts to feel like it is an Asian dish, like it tastes like it has soy sauce. So again, it's like just bringing it to that point but not going over where it's like, okay, this is totally not Mexican food anymore. So definitely using it as more of a flavor enhancer than a star ingredient. I have a vegan, let's see if I can say this, Worcestershire sauce, micheladas. If you love micheladas, this is a key ingredient for your micheladas. Um, but again, you can use this in a bunch of other savory dishes. You know, the walnut meat that I talked about earlier, you can add a little bit of the vegan Worcestershire sauce to it and it'll amplify that flavor. So definitely something I have all the time in my fridge, ready to go. And this is kind of a funky one that you're gonna be like, what? Okay, I didn't really think about that, but okay. So we talked about tofu earlier, but what about fermented tofu? So I got this at my local Asian grocery store and it, you open it, it still smells like tofu, but it has a funk. Uh, it's not an overpowering funk. 
And it's also not stinky tofu, which some of us may know about. It's not that. So this definitely is still a mellow fermentation that, um, that still smells a lot like tofu that we're used to, but it has that fermentation definitely that kind of uh, amplifies the flavor. And so you could use this liquid if you wanted to. Um, if you're making a cheese and you're like, oh, I don't have time to use the probiotics and let my cheese sit, sit for a while on my counter. In, instead, you can add some of this liquid and it'll give a little bit of fermented flavor to whatever it is that you're doing. So fermented tofu liquid. <laughs> um, and then, of course, I'm going to just go through these other ones. Oh, I, I, I'm i like going off on my list here. Wakame. Uh, some people know it as furikake. Um, or stuff that folks use to season rice or rice balls. Um, it's a it's a sea vegetable. It has a nice uh, a little bit of saltiness and a, a lot of flavor. So this is one thing that you can use, like if you're making your uh, your own version of tuna or just sprinkling this over rice or adding it to your saute just to give a little bit of something. I like to also add this over ramen. Definitely an essential in the kitchen. Another big essential, liquid smoke. So if you are trying to achieve that carne asada that tasted like it was just asado out in your barbecue at the family party, um, or that bacon that you just cooked that's hickory smoked, you're gonna do it with this liquid smoke. So uh, you definitely wanna have this. And for this, a teeny tiny bit goes a long way. So literally drops, don't even get into tablespoons. like. Try a quarter teaspoon taste and then, cause this will quickly overpower your dish if you're not careful. So a little, little bit goes a long way. Um, and let's see here. So, so, so fermented tofu I talked about. Um, and I just have a few extras. So this black salt, which is pink, uh, it's called kalamanuk. You can see the name there, kalamanuk. Uh, if you're making a, a little scramble, a tofu scramble or whatever, the sulfuriness is gonna give it that little bit of egginess. I also use this for my rompope or eggnog for the holiday season. Perfect, works like a charm. A, a few other extras, black garlic, much better than your average raw garlic. It's, it's mellow, it's kind of sweet, and it adds a ton of flavor. Black garlic, make sure you have some all the time in your cupboard and if you're even if you're making a sauce that you blend up or you want to chop this up and add it to something it's going to make it so much better i love to saute vegetables in plum vinegar it adds a little bit of salty acid to them um, and it's just so so delicious and i also have some uh, vegan fish sauce if fish sauce is your thing like there's something for everybody nowadays so you know just tons of things that you can add to your cupboard. I have like fermented black beans that you can also add, um, you know, as you blend ingredients up or you can um, uh, pulse these in a food processor to break them up and sprinkle them on something. It's gonna add a little bit of fermentation, lots of flavor. All right, I'm gonna scoot these over. Let me check the questions and we can hop into the next category. So let's see here. All right, I'm learning so much. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I am always happy to help people navigate through this because it's so. Um, if you're if you're new to it, it's just kind of hard to navigate like what is going to make your food taste so much better. So black garlic, um, you can probably find it online since a lot of people are shopping online nowadays. I got that black garlic at my um, uh, local Chinese grocery store. So I think you can even find black garlic at like a Whole Foods nowadays or something like that. All right, so of course for flavor enhancers, chiles. So um, I have a lot of chiles on hand. You don't have to have as many as I do, but I love different types of chiles. Like for example, chipotle. Everybody thinks, oh, chipotle, like one flavor? No. <laughs> Chipotle has like a few different types of varieties. Um, like for example, these are chipotle meco. You can see they're uh, kind of a brown shade, long um, and, and uh, flat chiles, which are kind of a little bit, I mean, they're all smoked, so they all have a smoky element to them. I feel like those are probably for me the smokiest of all. 
Uh, and then you have moritas, which are a little bit shorter, a little bit more um, uh, wide and more vibrant, more of like a punch of like, I'm Chile Morita and I'm here and you can taste me. <laughs> um, and then you have chipotles and adobo, which the adobo is really, um, you know, just as important as the chile itself. Uh, it be, you can, uh, what I like to do is, um, this can is small, but I, I like to buy a bigger can of chipotles and adobo. And I like to blend them in my blender and then put them in a, a container in my fridge rather than like pulling out an individual chile and like chopping it and trying to, you know, work it into the dish. I, because it's already a paste, all of it, I just take a tablespoon out and I'll add it to something and it's already a paste. That's just my trick. It makes life in the kitchen easier and less messy. It's messy one time and then it's easy all the other times. Now my star chiles that I like to use aside from chipotles are chile guajillo, which pack a, a nice bit of punch. Um, they're still on the mild side, so they're not overly spicy. Sometimes when they're a little bit smaller, they will be a little bit spicier. And ones that uh, you would use if you wanted less of a spice are chile ancho, which are ancho means wide. You can see that they're wide. They used to be poblanos, they're now dried chiles. And these will, are typically used in mole sauces, pipianes, uh, and uh, you know, enchiladas, you have your guajillos, right? Uh, and so they're the probably the most prominent chiles that are used in Mexico. And then of course there's others like Buya here, which uh, packs a little bit more of a punch um, in terms of spiciness. Typically the, they say that the smaller the chile, the more spicy it becomes. So that tends to be pretty true. I have a bunch of dried chiles like New Mexico greens, New Mexico reds, chile de árbol. Now these, if in any of these chiles, the way that you enhance the flavor is toasting them, dry toasting them in a dry skillet or pan frying them. But I'm telling you that these will make you cough. The smoke that will come out of these is like, whew, it's, it's really spicy sometimes. Um, but they pack such a beautiful um, uh, flavor. And then you have your chile um, tepins or piquins, little chiles, this is a powder form. You know, I love adding chiles to everything you know that I can, and so you have to you know make sure that you have a bunch of different varieties depending on what it is that you're making, whether it's enchiladas, mole, um, whether you're just using your chipotles um, to add to like roasted cauliflower or whatever it is. You know, you can definitely take it in so many different directions. All right, let's see here, and then spices, all the spices that you love. I love Mexican oregano, cumin. I use a lot of cumin in my cooking, a lot. Like it's maybe a little too much, but it's good. Um, I also have red pepper flakes on hand all the time. Um, and I keep it pretty simple, salt, pepper, um, and uh, turmeric and things like that. But definitely have your spices on cue all the time. All right. So we're getting close to the end here, folks. So let me keep it going. I see some good comments here. An online source for chiles. Um, I would recommend, there's a brand called Los Chileros that has really good quality things. Um, I don't know if they sell chiles on native seeds, but that's a website to check out. But you can always reach out to me afterwards and I can definitely share more details. Also, if you go to our website, the Todo Verde website, I do list the online resources that we use for the book. Um, in my website or on my website. So you can always go there and check out what I'm referencing for these online vendors so you can easily order online. All right, so let's see here. And I just, I didn't plug in the second computer and I'm on 2%, so I'm gonna grab that. Actually, let me just grab that timeout with a quick second. All right, I got it. My partner is gonna be like, I told you to plug in your computer. I plugged in one of them, but I have two right now and only two outlets. Okay, there we go. Whew. All right, got that done. All right, so sweeteners, let's get into it. My favorite of all time. I know a lot of people use agave out there, but maple syrup is it. So 
Maple syrup is so delicious. It works from everything from your pancakes to agua fresca to cocktails, whatever it may be. I prefer it than like anything else, simple syrup. Reason being is that this is uh, this liquid form of sweetener is the easiest, one of the easiest out there for your body to digest. So it's probably the most natural and the best for you, your body generally. Um, and so I just love to use it. Big thing though, is a lot of people buy sweetener that's flavored like maple syrup. So make sure it's not flavored like maple syrup. Make sure it's 100% maple syrup. Pure maple syrup is what you're looking for. And it's going to be a little bit more expensive, but it's going to be worth every penny. So, so good. The other big sweetener is definitely dates. Smoothies, you can make a date paste out of it. Um, you can get medjool dates. There's different varieties of dates, but I always have dates on hand and also like they're just a good snack. If you're just hungry, dates are great. Um, so definitely always have dates on hand. And then I like to have a raw turbinado sugar. Um, this is actually a coconut sugar that I just happen to have on hand. So again, you know, my cakes and things, they usually come out, you know, a little bit darker because I use like the wheat flour and, and like a brown sugar or brown colored sugar, like a raw turbinado. So lower on the processing. So my vanilla cake will never look white. It'll always look brown, but I'm okay with that. Um, so, but these things are just better all around, a little bit more nutrient dense to them, even though they are sweeteners. And the most kind of pure form of sugar that you can get at your Mexican grocery store or online is piloncillo or panela. Um, they go by, you know, interchangeable terms or different interchangeable names. And you can use these to make a variety of different dishes. Usually, um, you know, things that are cooked in the oven or um, something that's cooked on your stove where this will melt down. And if you're not using all of it, I've used a hammer to break this up. So cutting board, hammer, break it into pieces. And then, and then you have the pieces that you need for that dish that you're making. All right. So those are my sweeteners that I have. I'm going to move these out of the way. And I'm going to get into my last categories here. I know we're getting over time, but I love sharing these things. And I want to thank you folks who are sticking with me here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this tray right here that's very heavy. Hopefully you don't see me drop everything. All right, so we are now in the other category, quote unquote, others. So Chef Sweetie, you can add that in there. So, um, oh, and I see here, substitute one-to-one -one white sugar with maple syrup and baking. Uh, I don't I don't really use maple syrup for baking too much because um, then you have to think about your liquid. So if you are um, gonna add like a cup of plant-based milk or whatever, but then you're switching it for maple syrup, then I just have to think about like, okay, is that ratio gonna be slightly off because it's too much liquid now? So just think about that. You may need to slightly adjust your recipe. Um, and I tend to use uh, raw sugar, like actual sugar sugar um, for my baking and then maple syrup more for um, liquid based things. But anything goes, you can definitely try it out. All right, so others, <laughs> the others are here. So some things that you need to use if you are planning to make your plant-based cheeses or uh, for example, like a flan or something like that, that like a custard that you want to set um, once it's refrigerated is gonna be this um, item called agar agar. And you can get it in a variety of different ways. You can get it in these like really light flakes. This is like a really light, airy, I can put it on my hand and like blow or sneeze and it'll just fly away. like. Uh, like dust almost, right? Um, and there's also more dense powdery versions of agar agar that you can get. You can also get it in these like noodle forms in a bar that looks like a bar of soap. Um, and so uh, the main reason I'm letting you know that you can get it in all those varieties is that if a, if a recipe calls for one tablespoon, which is a lot actually, like say it calls for one teaspoon of the agar powder, it's not going to equal one one 
teaspoon of this. It's gonna, it's, you're gonna need more of this because this is more dense. So, you know, if you're using the bar, if you're using the noodles, it's gonna be slightly different. So whenever you're using agar, go by the grams, go by the weight versus the receptacle that you're using to measure it. Um, and that will give you a more accurate reading of how much of whatever type of agar it is that you're using. And what this is gonna do is you usually have to um, apply heat. So like you'd add this to the liquid that you want to um, create like the gelatin out of. Sometimes it'll be water and then you mix it with other things. Sometimes it'll be a cream um, or whatever it is that you're making and you heat it so that it melts this into it just like a gelatin and then you pop it in the fridge let it set for a couple hours and you have something that has completely set and is creamy another thing that i really like to use is um egg replacers and there's a variety of different types of egg replacers depending on what it is that you're doing so i mentioned earlier the flaxseed right so you can do flaxseed with some water and this is going to be great as a binder for baked goods. You can even use this technically as a binder for your burger patties, whoever had that question earlier, to help kind of bring it all together and keep it together. And that is kind of the most straightforward way that you would use that. But then there's other uh, products out there that you can get, like this egg replacer you would also use for like a baked good, or if you're trying to make some sort of a, you know, a, a, a a cake or, or anything that you want to bind, you could use it for that burger patty or whatever it is. And it has things like uh, potato starch, tapioca flour, psyllium husk that are essentially just kind of helping to keep things together. So that you would use this for the same way that you would use the flaxseed. However, there are other things that you can use as an egg replacer, which are slightly different. Like an egg replacer like this one here um, would be like if you're trying to make an egg scramble. Now you're trying to eat an egg versus mix an egg as a binder for something else, which are what these other ones are for. Now this is like, I'm trying to eat a scrambled egg. I'm trying to eat a scrambled egg. Um, so these are a little bit different. I haven't really played with, um, you know, like this brand in a baked good or anything like that. I imagine that it might work, but I haven't done it yet. This I have used for my flan and it works because it also has a flavor of egg. So these taste, they're trying to pass off as like the taste of an egg. Whereas um, the other things that I mentioned would not work for the same purposes. Those are more like binder only, no egg flavor. Um, so just note the difference of the different ways that you can use egg replacers and they all advertise themselves as egg replacers, which is confusing. Um, but once you start playing with them, you'll realize like, oh, okay, I can't use that for this because it serves a different purpose. All right, so that's egg replacers, coconut milks, coconut creams. You better have some of these in your cupboards because what they do is they provide a good amount of fattiness. Um, so if you're trying to make a, um, uh, like, you know, a frosting or a, uh, a flan, a coconut-based flan or something that requires a good amount of fat, like an ice cream, these are great for that because they, they have a high fat content. And I prefer to use canned versus a carton because these are high fat content. So especially the cream and what you would do is like you would add the can to your fridge and let it sit in the fridge overnight and get nice and chilled. And it's going to in the chilling process, separate the kind of more liquidy coconut milk from or the coconut water from the fat. The fat will rise to the top. And then if you're using uh, a recipe that calls for like heavy fat, you're going to only scoop out the fat that settled at the top and not the liquid at the bottom. And that's going to give you this nice texture that you're looking for too, for whatever that recipe may be. So coconut milks, creams. Another big one that I use is coconut oil. Now I do not use coconut oil for cooking whatsoever. I know some folks do. I don't prefer it. It's high in saturated fat. And two things with this coconut oil. I only buy refined. So some people buy virgin coconut oil. Virgin coconut oil tastes like coconut. And when some I'm making these recipes, I don't want that coconut flavor. If I'm making tamales and this is replacing my lard, I don't want it to I don't want my tamales to taste like coconut, right? I want them to taste like tamales. And so refined has stripped the coconut flavor of that. And um 
and you can see here that it's like this, you know it's solid it's like a butter right that um, sets at room temperature so when it hits the fridge if i even if i heat this up in something and then it hits the fridge it's going to help solidify it so i also use this in cheese to give that little fattiness that you need in cheese um and it uh, again should not taste like coconut refined coconut oil and then once this sets in the fridge it's going to solidify the way that you see it solidified here in this jar so it also serves the purpose of the fattiness um and 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 helping it set and the last couple things i'll talk about here are just uh probiotics if you're fermenting your own cheeses um you can use a variety of different probiotics out there to help you get the cultures going and and living in whatever it is that you're fermenting and that will help to get that funk that you're looking for in your cheeses i didn't mention egg replacer sometimes folks use the garbanzo bean liquid just real quick uh, it's um it's called aquafaba you can whip it whip it good i didn't i didn't do that on this thing right now embarrassed um but you can, you can do that to create a like egg white mixture and tapioca flour another binder another thing that will be great in your quesadilla based cheeses it'll give that kind of like melty gooey you're never going to get this like full string of melted cheese but this will give it a little bit of that like pooliness in your cheese that you're looking for all right and i'm not going to get into all the greens eat your greens all the different kinds spinach kale all of it use it in different ways throw it in your smoothie it's so easy to mask it that way um but the last thing i will talk about is if you do decide to move forward with a plant-based uh diet the only supplement that folks ever recommend out there is b12 because B12 is um, something that you typically get when you eat dairy, eggs, meat, all the things, and not so much from a plant-based diet. So you do need to start to take B B12 um, regularly just to make sure you're getting that nutrient. That's the only thing I would say. Uh, and aside from that, this is just like, you know, you should have spirulina on hand um, because spirulina is just so nutrient dense and it's just another thing that you should have uh, that you can put a little bit in a smoothie or whatever it may be just to give you that punch of nutrients that you need on a regular basis. So wow, I have gone through so much. Uh, I'm going to go through any other questions we have here. I feel like I am all talked out, but I'm excited for all of you who are so interested it makes me so happy. Okay, so, oh, folks are using just egg for quiche. It turned just perfect. Uh, yes, absolutely. That's good to know because I, I I could play with it that way. I've just used it as, as strictly a scramble so far. I haven't really played with it any other ways. Um, coconut uh, sweetened condensed milk is really good. Yep, it sure is. It is really good. In fact, I did a ice cream collaboration and we did a dulce de leche ice cream using coconut milk um, sprinkled with a little bit of sal de colima. It was just so perfect. All right, let's see here. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, someone here saying this has been one of the best classes I've ever taken. Thank you so much. And we didn't even cook anything. We're just talking. We're listening to me talk, but, uh, but I'm happy that, you know, I'm able to open up my door, so to speak, and let you take a peek into what my refrigerator and my cupboards look like. Um, Cause I think that that's huge for a lot of people. If you don't know what ingredients to use, you're gonna feel like you're a little bit stuck. And so once you can start playing with these a little bit more, um, I think it's gonna just open up so many opportunities um, for you to, to enjoy so many more meals. All right, awesome. Let's see, I see another question mark here. Help and remove the briny flavor of jackfruit. So an absolute must for me personally, I've seen videos of people just opening the can, they dump the liquid out and then they just dump the whole pieces of jackfruit in a pan with seasoning. Please don't do that. <laughs> um, I, I have a, a video that you can check out on our Lolo Verde site that shows you how I break down jackfruit, which is squeezing all that brine out. If you really want it out, you can soak it and squeeze everything out, then soak it in water 
um, to get more of that brine out. But the brine for me, if I squeeze it, I don't need to do the soaking. I feel like that is enough for me to uh, move forward with the dish, but definitely check out our Todo Verde website and you can uh, see exactly how I break down jackfruit. All right, let's see here. Wow, lots of questions and comments. I'm loving all of it. I'm sorry if I skipped over any, I'm just kind of giving it a quick glance. We'll talk about the franchise out of the USA. Maybe one day we need to focus on here first though. Let's see, how versatile are they? Um, will you be doing other videos? Yeah, I have actually a cooking class coming up so you can check out on uh, Chef's Feed. We'll be making a quesadilla cheese, which I talked about as well as chorizo, and then we'll be making a quesadilla with the cheese and the chorizo. So, um, and I do have a variety of other classes. You, again, can go to the Todo Verde website, and I teach classes every Saturday right now. They're community-based classes, um, and so you can see what recipes we'll be working on for the next uh, couple months. I think right now we have February up and are working on adding March classes. All right. Is there a particular probiotics for cooking? Um, so for cooking, don't cook your probiotics. So um, you want to, uh, like if you're making the cheese, if, if there's any cooking part of it, like cook all the other ingredients. And then once it's pretty much complete, uh, you, then you add your probiotics because if you cook them, they're alive, they're live cultures. So if you cook them, they're gonna die. If you add lemon juice and too much salt, they're gonna die. So you wanna keep it like pretty neutral um, and, and let those probiotics, the cultures like live on your counter in that cheese or whatever it is that you're doing, the crema, whatever. Um, and, and it depends on what region you're in. Like sometimes, you know, things could take 15 hours to ferment. It could take 24, it could take 48. It depends like, do you live somewhere cold, hot, humid, dry? Um, all of that factors in, but it's a matter of you just kind of going, checking on it often, smelling, tasting. And then when you feel like, okay, this crema, for example, feels like it has a nice fermentation to it, then I can add, you know, additional flavors, more salt, more this, more that. And that way you don't kill the cultures early on. All right. Um, and again, my book is called La Vida Verde. Uh, you can go to the Todo Verde website, todoverde.org, to check out more details. Um, do you just crumble firm tofu? Yeah, that's, I love to just crumble extra firm tofu. You can also slice it and pan sear it. I, whenever I do pan seared tofu that way, I try not to cut them uh, too thick. I do kind of like um, maybe like quarter to half an inch thick slices, pan sear them season, them, season them well, and then maybe like put mole, like mole verde with... Um, pan seared tofu is delicious um but you gotta do it justice you know don't just do the cubes and like barely sear it or whatever like like give it a little bit more all right thank you all so much and Shesfi just dropped the link for the upcoming class in the comments here so you can definitely check that out thank you all so much for like i said coming into my home into my kitchen today I want to be accessible to you. So you can always go to um, the website and email us. You can uh, go to Todo Verde on Instagram, DM us or my personal Instagram page. And I will try to get back to you as soon as possible. We've been getting a lot of DMs, which is great. Um, and a lot of messages of people like at the store, like, what do I get this or that? Um, so I'm happy to help you navigate through that. I'm with you on this journey. Um, I'm so glad that there's so many more of these products available to all of us. So um, hopefully, hopefully we will reconnect uh, in some other cooking class again soon. But thank you all so much for joining again. Thanks to Chef Speed and Lexus for making this possible. Hope to see you all soon. Good luck on your plant-based journey. Bye everyone.